Hi, everyone. Welcome. So glad you're here with us today. We'll give everyone just a moment to uh, get the full thing. <laughs> get connected. Hopefully, you can see me and hear me. I see Holly might not be connected to audio yet. So what's up? All right, if you wouldn't mind um, muting yourself. Oh, about what? I, I hear some, some chatter. If you wouldn't mind muting. I have your first part? Okay. So let me. All right, we'll do that. I'm glad to see some uh, faces from earlier today on uh, our virtual PD. We'll give, looks like we're just adding a few more folks. Hi, Katie, this is Sue Rosinski. Can you see me? Because I don't feel like I'm coming up. Um, your video is off, but I do hear you. Oh, oh, got it. Okay, thank you very much. There we go, we see ya. All right. Well, welcome everyone. We are so glad to have you here today. Um, some of you have been on our adventure uh, in the forest and uh, at the mill today, you're going to get um, another chance. Even if you have or have not joined us, you're gonna get a little different spin on our conversation today about the timber industry. Um, we'll have some familiar faces if you've been with us and uh, we'll get to dig in a little bit deeper. I'm sure you, I know your students had amazing questions during our virtual field trips, um, but today's also your chance to get all of your questions asked. Uh, because we are going to be, uh, we're out already outside and we have our guests with us um, at our host at Gutchess Lumber in Cortland, New York. Um, we are going to actually jump right in um, and head up our introductions afterwards. I want you to um, first get a chance to understand and take a look at what's happening at their mill site um, as they, they're, they're finishing up their day. So buckle up everyone, we are headed into our, our virtual field trip portion of this um, virtual PD and be sure to ask, uh, unmute yourself or put your questions in the chat and we'll be able to communicate that to, to our hosts. Uh, so I am really excited. Uh, I'm going to switch the spotlight over. Um, Jeremiah Best is in the field. He'll be leading us through this experience, but we are with John Lyon today, and John is the general manager of Gutchess Lumber and um, knows the ins and outs of this mill. So hi, John. Welcome, and i um, so glad to introduce you to our teachers today. Thank you. I appreciate you joining us today. What you're looking at right here is our uh, our starting point of the the, log, the logs coming into the mill, being on coming into the yard, being unloaded by several of these trucks, sorting the logs by the species, and then after they're sorted by species, they are scaled by uh, guys that will come through and uh, give the logs a grade. It then ensure the species are separated properly. And then this loader you see out front here is taking the species and piling them in a row according to the species out in the log yard. And at a later time, these logs will be sawn mill uh, according to the row. And the reason why we do do the, the scaling of the logs is so we know what, what value you put on the logs and what value we need to get out of the logs to ensure that we are uh, getting all, all the yield we can out of the logs and make a number. <laughs> some of these red oak that you see right here in front of us, you can see some discoloration right here where the log is getting to the point where it's uh, at the, the end of its life to where now we're able to utilize the lumber before it does die off completely. And there are some, some stress cracks in there just because of the age. And the, the other logs that we have here do have some cracks, but they are, we're able to utilize those in our sawing process in the mill. So 
So we're really starting in the middle of this process. Um, we are all gonna get a chance to move to the woods a little bit later and talk about how uh, these uh, how lo these logs are harvested, but this is really the step where um, you're 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 processing for people who will eventually use these to create um, hardwood products that we find in our everyday lives. So thinking about you know the end in mind, who's your target market? We will we will sell our lumber to any uh, industry that would like to use their uh the lumber for furniture for molding uh for flooring for uh, plywood and so and not all of this uh, lumber is staying here in the states um where where does your uh lumber eventually end up what what other countries we're in a we're in a global market. China is a big buyer of our lumber, which brings the uh, the cost and uh, the revenue back into the United States, and it helps our community here in Portland. And how long do these logs that we're looking at, uh, how long do they actually stay uh, here in the yard? Um, what kind of, how, I see some with snow on them, some without snow. Do they move pretty quickly or do you have them sitting for a while? For this time of year, there's, there's very little spoilage in the logs. So therefore we can keep them in, in the yard for a, a longer period of time. But for the most part, we try to get this whole yard rotated within us. So four to five weeks, we should be able to get the logs that come in through the mill. In the summertime, due to the warmer weather, we will put water on the logs. And this will help eliminate the, uh, the stain and the degrade of the logs. So therefore, we'll have, we still will rotate them within a, a four to five week period. Now, what process are we looking at next? What's happening over here? Is this the first step? Yes, after the logs are put in the rows and we predetermine what species we want to run in the mill, the loaders will bring the logs down to this workstation where the picker will place them on the conveyor in a single file line to be able to feed those into the debarker. So that conveyor belt is moving uh, the logs into um, that building. And uh, as we step inside to see what's happening, um, could you talk a little bit about what happens to that bark that's taken off the outside of the trees? The bark is utilized for the, when we ship it out of here for mulch that you'd find in your gardens, in your, uh, your flower beds, mulch around your house. It's, it's ground, uh, after it leaves here, it is ground again in a, another, another department, another company to be able to uh, sell this. And so what's happening now? I see a roller and I see a lot of action happening inside that cage. Now there's an operator that is controlling the, uh, the rolls that are going up and down as holding down pressure on the logs to be able to keep it from moving as it's going through the drum as taking the bark off. He is able to control the, the pressure of the the debarker arms to be able to get the bark off, but yet not damage the wood fiber on the log itself. So I think it's really interesting um, that you have this mill and you have this byproduct um, and that there are other industries, you know, local to you that are making their living off of your byproduct. Um, and I think that's a theme that our teachers are gonna hear quite a bit 
throughout this conversation uh, with you is that you know you are you are utilizing every single piece of these these trees that come in. I think that makes us feel really good about the lumber industry, at least for me. Yes, every part of this log is utilized all the way through to where if you cut the sawdust we utilize to fuel our boilers to be able to kiln dry our lumber. The, uh, the, the, the product that does not make the lumber will be chipped in our chipper and out will be utilized in a chipboard plant. They'll be used for uh, pellets that you'd burn in pellet stoves. So there's many more uses for our chips that we uh, also make in our process. So uh, the operator that's moving these through, what types of what type of training does that take for this job? It's more of a, a hand-eye coordination. He has many buttons that he has to control at one time uh, to be able to control him and to move the log through the, the machine. And to be able to make sure that the logs that he's bringing into the mill are the quality of logs that we we desire to be able to get a a, a good product out of. Great. So as we uh, leave uh, this facility and we look to the other side to see what the log looks like once it um, is debarked. Um, Let's talk a little bit about um, the impact that Gutches has in your Cortland community. About how many people are employed at your facility? Just in this site here, we're around 160, 170 employees at this site that are working in our dry, on our dry line and in our mill. We're running two shifts uh, in both the dry line that, that deals with a kiln dried lumber and here in the mill, we also have two shifts. Here you'll see the logs that are being stacked up for our second shift tonight. We'll run that, the day shift will be a nine hour shift, the night shift will be a, a eight hour shift. We run uh, 40 to 45 hours a week. It all depends on what the needs are for our production. I will say when we had our first field trip this morning at 1030, there were not this many logs here. So you have stockpiled through the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll typically try to get on the ground uh, anywhere from 800 to 1,000 logs. All depends on the size. You'll notice there are some pretty good size logs here. Uh, so there's a, there's a good volume here today. Here's one log that we uh, that has some decay to it, some rot. So this log is definitely uh, has been uh, a good log to be able to take and still get some value out of it before it has really rotted completely. Now I think it's really interesting um, taking a look at the um, the barcodes that are on your tree and what is the purpose of those. These will identify the log when they come in with the scalers will place on there to be able to uh, track these logs and uh, find out if we're getting the proper value of each log. And then if we can find the uh, data of a consistent run, if we're getting the proper footage out of them. Here you're seeing the uh, metal detector. We're ensuring that there's no metal in our logs going into the mill to, uh, to limit the damage to the saws, such as nails, uh, barbed wire, uh, tree stand spikes.
I think that was a really interesting concept for our students that um, just like you'd go through a metal detector at the airport or in a county or government building, um, the trees have to go through a metal detector also. And I know we're going to be walking in to learn more about your saws and the investment um, of humans, machines, and the actual product itself, but it's really for, uh, you know, that, that metal detector could save, um, I'm sure, a few hundred dollars. Yes, typically a brand new saw costs us up to $800 per saw. And now you'll be seeing, coming into our file and we'll resharpen our saws. After an eight hour run time, we will bring you saws in and recondition the saws. And this is just one phase of that recondi reconditioning process. The saws will go around this, this grinder several times until we get the, the desired quality of the tooth that we'll be putting back out on the band mill. And so, like you said, this saw uh, is going through this process um, after eight hours. Then That's it gets correct. put back on. Yeah. This file here is ensuring that the saw is consistent as far as flat and it has no twist or uh, So if there was a twist found or any pulling or deformity, what happens then? Once he finds that and finds the inconsistency, he'll be able to use a roller to be able to roll out that, that bump in the saw or the inconsistency in the saw. There's an anvil right there also, and he'll use a hammer to pound out any, any inconsistencies also in, in the saw. And we see some automation, but we also see humans overseeing the process. How much of your lumber mill is automated and how much would, uh, is uh, controlled by, by human capital? We do have, over the years, we have had more and more automation. These grinders are set up and they do have the ability to run on their own, but they do have to be readjusted with the with the operators for these. There is one, one machine over here to our left that has uh, the ability to be automated to where once it's set up, it will, it will bench that saw automatically like the first individual that you first seen that was uh, trying to flatten out the saw. So there is some automation in here to this, to the file room. So as we move back to um, thinking about our logs, I mean, teachers, any questions um, do, that you have? Um, what are you curious about? Now, John, as we look at your employees and your, you have about a 160 person workforce, um, do you expect that uh, employees um, from, that you're getting from your local community, that they have experience in milling uh, or in forestry, what's your expectation? Uh, what we're looking for is we're looking for uh, individuals with drive, uh, motivation, uh, the desire to want to come to work every day. And Gutchess Lumber has trained for the most part in this sawmill all their employees. With our uh, the training programs we have, it does take. Uh, several years to get a filer to the point where he has the ability to be successful with the quality that we expect out of this filing room. And we do have a question. Um, what tree spe species has had the greatest demand? Uh, hard maple is a uh, very demanding and our most uh, sought after species here. But we do hard maple, red maple, red oak, white oak, ash, cherry, uh, are our standard uh, hardware lump, hard, hardwood lumber here.
So a couple of questions that are coming in. Jen wants to know uh, about how many machines does a piece of lumber have to go through from start to finish? Well, there's, there's probably over 50 pieces when it comes to conveyors and workstations, there's probably 50 pieces of equipment that this lumber will uh, touch before it gets out to be stacked in this, in this mill. So Susan also has a question. She said, you know, I heard that these logs in your facility, they're going for flooring, furniture, molding. She was curious, are there specific mills that make pencils or do the leftover pieces of, of your lumber go to another facility to be used um, to make pencils? No, we, uh, this is a hardwood mill for the uh, pencils. We, uh, we generally just keep it, it stick to the molding, the flooring. Most of our small pieces will go uh, in the chipper to make our, our chip product. All right, so what are we looking at first? It's kind of tough to see Jeremiah through the cage, just so you know. This is our head saw that's taken a log and taken a round log and making square, four square sides to it. And then he's also taken a few boards off. And once that log gets the four sides, that comes what we call a cant. And therefore that cant will go up to another saw that will be able to produce more boards. And we can't see at the moment, but that's a human operating um, that saw, is that right? Yes, he's down there. We do have some optimization on this carriage. We have a scanner that will help the Sawyer make a decision on how to set that log to get the, the most value out of that first cut. That first space that was just cut right there was uh, determined by an optimizer, a scanner. And after that point, the Sawyer is determining what thickness of board is coming off that log. We have a question about how communication works in the mill. Uh, one of our teachers asked, is there some feedback mechanism for the op for the bark operator, uh, from the debarker, um, or from somebody who's loading the logs um, to let the Sawyer know what log is coming? Or is that all detected by a sensor and then relayed to the operator? All these logs that come in this mill are pre-sorted. So every log is, an oak log right now at this point. So the logs that are debarking can come in here uh, without no uh, any further sorting. But we do you for communication, we do have two way radios in a saw cab and throughout the mill. So there is quite a bit of communication that goes on when there becomes an issue, whether it's a quality issue or a machine down issue. So what's happening in that little booth right now is somebody's using a little joystick, right? To move that log and just like we saw in the debarker, is that similar to what's happening right now? In, in the resaw right here, there's yeah. an operator in there that, yeah. He, no, has, he has control. He has controls in that in that saw that will be able to uh, determine what thickness of board that he takes. So another question that came up was about how long does the average saw blade last? Um, will it deteriorate based on the species of the tree going through the saw? 
we would like, we try to get approximately five to six months out of the saw. All depends on the, if there's any damage to the hardware. And so what's next after this? So we're seeing um, the Sawyer create the cant kicking off one of those edge pieces. And then where do we go next? Once, once that uh, board in the cant split, that board goes out of conveyor and will, will be conveyed down a center line to where it'll be sorted according to the, the weighing on the board versus a board that's straight edge that won't need the edge anymore. But we can take it down to the, to the next step of the, the process. So as we move down, um, we had another question about your labor and your workforce. If teachers are talking to their um, students about this type of career, what? What does your entry level position pay? We could start anywhere from 16 dollars and up. The uh, the workforce is is really really tough right now as far as uh, competition. So it's a uh, it's a pretty competitive workforce out there right now to be able to get workers. But not only do we have uh, the pay, but we also have uh, benefits, very good benefits that would uh, be attractive to new workers that come to us, health benefits, 401k, profit sharing. We're also an ESOP company, employee owned. So after the boards are cut, they come to this next line here. After the boards are separated, they will be going through our edger. And this is an optimized edger. This is when I'll go through a, a scanner that has lasers that'll be able to take, as you will, a, a picture of the, of the board and determine the best solution to be able to edge that board to the, the highest yield, the best yield of the board. So this scanner is looking at a board that may have a rough edge um, that was, you know, originally cut off that can't, and then it's scanning, imaging it, and then we're seeing up on the screen um, how it's going to make it a usable, saleable, consistent board. And, and the saws will automatically move on their own according to the solution that the computer will tell it. After the boards do come out of the back to edger, they will be merging with the, the boards that have already been sorted that had the square edges. So with all those boards coming together, they're simulated, and now they're on what we call the inspection deck.
they're flipping the board and looking at both sides of these boards to give the board a grade, determine how clear it is for a value. The crayons that they're using in their sticks is uh, putting a what we call the grade mark. And if there's any more trimming, it needs to be done with these boards. And I think it's tough for our uh, our teachers at home to see, but there is a little crayon at the end of that, and you see him, you know, making a couple denotations. Of it's it's he is writing actually writing on the board. And so then that writing then tells them what to do with the next step of the process. And what does training look like for this piece of the job? We will send the, our, our trainees to an, what we have an inspection, inspection class. It's a GLCU is what uh, we have made. And we have a, an experienced instructor uh, that we have that works for us in-house. It's been an employee for many years that will teach a individual that has virtually no lumber experience and get them to understand our industry, our culture and how to grade lumber. And typically that class will take up to uh, two months, one to two months. And then once a gal that Class, they will come out here and be able to start the uh, hands-on training process, which could take up to several more months before they get onto this deck. And then once they're on the deck, it, it will take uh, two to three years to get an inspector to be consistent enough without consistent coaching to be able to get to our, our standards here. Now, because they are two, there's two of them, are they just checking each other's work? Is that what the second person is doing? No, there's, well, we could get up to nine to 12,000 pieces of this lumber coming through just on a daily basis. And what they do is they skip every other board. So they have time to be able to make the right decision on a grade for the for the board. So after they have graded the lumber, then what happens in that next? Who decides where those boards are going and how they'll be sorted? This individual is, is in loading the boards in a mug and do a uh, a trim, a, a standard trimming before they get inputted to the computer. With our input station here. And then once it's inputted into the computer, which would be the grade and the trim mark, that board is in that mug that has more or less an address. And that lug will know where to put that board all the way up through the process until it's into the sorter and into a bay. So we do have a question. Uh, they said you, as we transition to our, our next step in the process, um, you mentioned using wood chips as fuel for parts of this process. Does the mill use any of the tree or byproducts as an energy source for the mill to run on? Yes, the, the sawdust will be transferred and separated and go into a silo. And after it's stored in the silo, it will be conveyed into our boilers. And those boilers produce steam. And that steam is transferred into foils that are in, in our kilns and that will generate the heat that we utilize to dry our lumber. And, and can you talk to us a little bit about a kiln? What, why do you have a kiln and why is that step really important for a lumber mill? When we put, when we put lumber on, on sticks and air dry it, the, 
the outside air will only take so much moisture out of lumber, uh, regardless of how long it stays out in, in the normal weather or air. Once it drew all the moisture out that we can't get any more with just being outside, then we put into a kiln. And then we could put more heat to that lumber and draw out the more of the moisture until we get down to a five or six percent moisture content. These cans you see here are what we cut and we'll make pallets out of. This will go to a secondary operation that we sell these to. This is a type of pallet that these would be made of. And how close or how far away are the um, pallet making uh, companies uh, that create that build these pallets in the mulch companies? Are they fairly close to Cortland? Yes, actually, this is a, a company that we do own. It's Paul Bunyan Products, and they do make they make the pallets out of our cans, and they also grind our our mulch and sell our mulch to various companies in individuals. I think one of the questions as we talk later with um, John Mueller and Matt Gutches, we're gonna have a chance to talk to them. So be thinking teachers about some questions you may wanna ask about um, vertical integration with this company because they, you're going to learn they do a lot. Um, from stepping into the forest and making um, some of these, uh, you know, the processing that we're seeing here in the mill, but then having a pallet company also, I think there's a lot to um, learn or inquire about as we think about um, all the ways that you can, you know, integrate a market. These are just two mills that our smaller logs would go to for more production. Do the same process as the current mills that we looked at. They still have scanners. The optimizers will scan the logs for the best open phase. In our next process here is where the, the camp will be broke down into boards until we get to a point where there's no more value on that camp. And then we'll make it into a sizable camp to where we'll sell to make pallets. And this is actually the end for the, the waste that we have, such as edging, slab, They'll come down this area and they'll be separated the sawdust with a fibrate conveyor. And then they'll go through this chipper, which will make our chips. What you see here is our silos that house our sawdust and our smokestack for our boilers that will produce our steam for the kilns. And about how much space do you take up in Cortland? Um, you know, if you have driven through Cortland, you have seen a Gutchess, uh, no matter, you know, it, it, you have a, a pretty, uh, interesting footprint there and especially being right in the city um so how much space do you take up well the road front it'd be really deceiving if you drive by on our on a road front but uh if you got into the plant you'd see it's much bigger and we're we're sitting on about 100 acres here we do have a sizable pond out back so that takes up quite a few acres but it's a it's a fairly sizable facility 
And so we saw the silos and we saw the, the steam. Are we coming up on one of your kilns right here? Yes, this is a kiln right here. There's actually steam coming out of the top of it as we speak. These packs of lumbers that you see here will be staged and are set to go in one of these kilns once it's uh, once we have enough volume to, to fill one. This would be a sack of lumber and give you an idea of how tall they are. These stickers right here is what we do to separate the, the lumber so we can get airflow to go through it and keep the support so the board has no, no movement so it don't warp or twist or cup on us in the drying process. And we also have these packs covered at the very top to keep the, the rain, the snow off the top and seeping down through those packs. And how, how long um, might that lumber sit for after it's been kiln dried? How, uh, how long does it take to then move that lumber? After it's kiln dried, there's no, there's, the staining process has stopped, the, uh, the molding process has stopped. So, but we do have to keep it under a roof and keep it dry. We can no longer let it weather or get, get rain on top of it. So once it comes out of kiln, we put it inside uh, a building to keep it fairly, keep it fairly dry. This is inside a kiln quite a bit of steam coming out of there right now. We had a teacher who asked um, the word, what does the word cup mean? And I, I don't know if that's what you said, or maybe it was, uh, maybe they misheard when we were out by the stacks. It's, it's when a, generally a board will lay flat. And if we, if we draw the moisture out of a, a, the water out of a board too quick, that could uh, make that board become unstable and cause it to uh, curl up, as you will, from side to side. And so then do you manage the transportation of the boards um, to your buyers or do they come and pick them up? This part right here is still in, a, in our secondary uh, production side of it as far as the kilns, but once it's packaged and it's put into our into our storage sheds, kiln dried, we do have vendors that will come pick it up in the for several different trucks. Excellent. Well, what other questions do our teachers have? We are just about at the end of the process and the end of our um, virtual field trip for this portion of our professional development today. What other questions do you have? Well, John, we cannot thank you enough for spending some time with us this afternoon uh, going through the mill tour. Um, we appreciate all the time you took out of your, I'm sure, busy day with a lot of uh, parts and pieces to manage. Um, and thank you so much for talking about what you do. Thank you. Oh, we do have another question. One of our teachers wants to know what drives lumber prices? Uh, the, the market conditions, uh, just like any other uh, commodity, uh, it all depends on the market conditions. Right now, the markets are fairly well with lumber and the demand. And what did the pandemic do to your markets? Um, obviously, with the world being shut down for a while, um, did uh, what did that do to you um, and your workforce and, um, and being able to ship to one of your biggest um, buyers, which is China? 
when it first started out, it was uh, it, it was pretty tough on us. Uh, the downturn, not only to uh, the employees, but the uh, the shipment of the lumber. But uh, in the last year, I think we've really made an upward swing. Last year was a good year for us. So uh, I hope to continue that also. And now we do have another follow-up question from that. Is the they want to know? Um, they have some brands. Is the lumber you're preparing for flooring? Is it for places like MJ Carroll or for a laminate from like a lumber liquidators? Um, that was a question that came in. This is this is strictly hardwood, no lamination. Uh, it would be molded and placed down on a uh, a floor as a a product of solid hardwood lumber. Well, I think this, that comes, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. This, this, this is a package lumber. This would be ready to be shipped right here. It has our logo on it, has our bands on it. It does have our uh, identification of what it is, four quarter cherry. We, uh, we paint the ends to uh, keep any more moisture to getting into the lumber, into, uh, for a presentation also. We uh, are very critical about the quality and the, uh, of the packs. And the quality has to be as far as uh, the preparation, the, uh, the squareness of the packs, the... Uh, these are packs here that you're looking at that's just been uh, bundled up that be need be stacked. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, we appreciate your spending your day with us. We really do. We know, we know you're a busy, busy guy. And so this has just been an awesome learning experience for us all day long. Thank you, John. Thank you. So at this point, we are going to um, let Jeremiah transition um, out from being there at the um, mill site, and we are going to spend some time together. So um, we are going to meet back with uh, Jeremiah in a little bit. You'll get a chance to meet him for the first time if you haven't yet. Um, but we're going to do a few introductions. Um, so I am really excited to be hosting um, this virtual PD today. I'm Katie Carpenter. I'm the State Director of New York Agriculture in the Classroom. And just a little bit about Ag in the Classroom. So we are an outreach program of Cordell University. Um, our job is to help K through 12 teachers uh, who have an interest in food and agriculture use food and agriculture as that lens for learning. Taking the concepts that you're integrating already, you have to teach about and helping you put a, a, a lens of ag on that, hopefully to get your students excited about the topic that you're covering, um, help make those real world authentic learning connections. And we try to do that in a whole lot of ways, but virtual PDs are one of our favorites, our, our professional development in, in general. We'll talk a little bit more about opportunities and um, uh, you know extensions for learning that you can include in your classroom. Uh, but I would love to get to know you all a little bit more. Um, we're glad you can join us, but I would love for everyone to do an introduction. And I think probably the easiest way to do that is um, just to start at the top um, of my list and I'll call out a few people. So Alexis, would you mind saying hello? Just tell us what you teach, where you teach, um, and why you were interested in this vir uh, virtual PD today. Here, we'll come back to Alexis. Um, we'll let her get situated. Clayton, do you mind saying hello? Hello, uh, I'm Clayton Kapoff. I teach third grade in Oxford, New York, and uh, I've done a lot of stuff with Ag in the Classroom, and and I just, I find it fascinating, everything that you guys offer. So uh, I sign up whenever you guys offer something so I, I can see how I can use it in my classroom. Um, 
third grade. I don't know how much logging we're going to be doing, but uh, you never know. It might come up. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Good to see you. All right. Next, I have Sierra Dator, if you could help me with that pronunciation. And we'll let you go next and say hello. Hi. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I teach in high school um, in Queens, New York. Um, and they gave me agriculture to teach this year. And I never taught it before. <laughs> so I, I've, ta I've taught biology or science, um, environmental science, ecology, but never agriculture. So um, I was luckily put in touch with, um, sorry, the phone is going off. Um, I was put in touch with uh, Sherry uh, Lightfall, and she's been really helpful and um, we got a grant. And so we're thinking there's, they're gonna build a hydroponic lab um, through New York Sun Works. And I'm just interested in like the urban agriculture aspect, like vertical farming, um, rooftop farming, and hopefully, you know, cause I mean, that's a living people can make in the city. And with the, you know, sustainability for 2050, you know, you want to have more um, ways of feeding people. So I don't know, it's exciting. <laughs> Oh, that's really exciting. We're glad to have you here, um, you know, in a piece that's not part of this because we are in Cortland today and not in Brooklyn, um, is that New York City has a really awesome group of urban foresters. Uh, so th that is also kind of a cool connection with this PD um, and what do urban foresters do and how do they help? And, um, you know, they have a lot of forests to manage, you know, and trees and plants to manage themselves. So yeah, I hope another cool career integration um, in, in, even when, if you're not in a rural place. Mm -hmm. All right, so next I have, um, Jen, I think I have two Jennifers. I have one Jen that's a guest. Do you want to say hello? Or we can let Jennifer Canale go. All right, I'll go. Um, hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm in New Hartford um, near Utica. Um, I teach uh, biology and earth science here and previously I was at the high school. The high school um, here is fortunate. We have ecology courses, we have AP ecology. Um, so we have a lot of environmental stuff, not so much at our junior high. Um, so I'm, I'm tackling the project. Um, of we have a, a big quad and, and to me, the perfect integration is to hopefully get a big garden out there, tie it into food services. So I have this grander plan um, and that is where I stumbled upon this website and some friends. So I'm really hoping to kind of tie in our normal everyday or science biology to the, to the environment, to what they can do at home, to right outside our window, there's our garden. Let's use those plants for photosynthesis. So, so that's my big dream and this is my first time joining. So thank you for letting me be here. Awesome. Yeah, this is a topic that we have not uh, covered previously, but we do a lot of aeroponic trainings, hydroponic trainings, so um, garden based learning. So yeah, hopefully, um, we'll see you many more times. Yeah, and this is I, I'm really we just ended with ecology and this is great into the whole you know, climate change, how, how they help the replanning. So this is wonderful. The students will be excited. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. So next I have Jessica. Do you want to say hello? Hi, I'm Jessica Mas. Hi, I'm from uh, Livingston Central School in Northern uh, Sullivan County, um, north of Middletown, Orange County. And I have teach uh, living environment and forensics in that for 16 years. And this year we had the opportunity to add um, intro to ag. So this has been great because every little thing I picked up from ag in the classroom, like with the Christmas tree, we did reach and all that with it. It was great to tie it in with that. Also with the living environment for classification and now moving on doing a little introduction to forestry next uh, next month. So this is great to add in. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Jessica. Now I have a J Monaco. I'm not sure what the first name is. So yeah. 
it's, so there's two Jessicas, so I apologize. Okay. Um, I'm Jessica Monaco. I teach fourth grade at Royalton Heartland Central School. And that's about, for anyone who doesn't know, probably about halfway between Buffalo and Rochester on Route 31. So we're in Western New York set section of the of the state. Um, this could not have come at a better time for my fourth grade students, not necessarily for the whole science aspect, but for social studies. We were talking about the explorers and how the explorers came to the new world and they found natural resources here that they didn't have back home and one of them being timber. And the discussion was timber, what is timber? Like we hear that called timber, but then for us to be able to experience it in the woods and then to go out and see at the sawmill today, it was perfect. It cut into our social studies. It helped cement some learning today. So it was fantastic. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. That's already making some cool connections with your students. Thanks for being here. Uh, Johanna, you wanna say hello? She may have stepped away. So we'll go to Megan. Megan, you want to say hi? Hi. Um, let's see. I don't know. If, uh, I don't know what camera on my school computer is like set up with Zoom because we don't typically do the Zoom thing. So I'm not going to waste time trying to get the camera. Um, but I teach uh, seventh grade STEM slash agriculture at Port Service Middle School. And I just love all the professional developments that you folks put on. Um, so I was excited to do this and, uh, you know, be able to tie in with our, you know, possibly bringing some stuff into this class that our tech teacher um, you know, does with like the, the wood shop kind of component of things and everything. So thank you very much for offering this up for us because you guys do a great job. Well, thanks, Megan. Megan's one of our superstars. She, she, we see her at all the PDs. So we're glad you're here, Megan. All right. How about Rachel? Rachel, you want to say hi? Hi, I'm Rachel Bennett. Um, I teach at Tully Junior Senior High School. Um, the pallet company that they, uh, Gutches was talking about is literally five minutes down the road from us here. Um, so we are familiar with their products around here. Um, so this works out really well. Uh, my consumer ag eight students do a whole forestry unit. Um, we talk about using the Biltmore stick, everything. Um, and so attending the other, uh, student version of the PD was great the other day because it really got the kids seeing the hands-on version. So hoping to take a little bit of what we do here and kind of fluff a little bit more into that unit that I've been working on with them. Awesome, thank you. Glad to have you with us. Uh, Susan, you wanna say hello? Hi everyone, and Katie, I'm not sure too. I don't think I have a camera somewhere. That we see you. We see your eyes and your hair. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I see nothing. But in any case, uh, and I'm not technically sound, but having said that, um, I teach sixth grade science at Hoover Middle School in Kenmore, New York. I've taken other classes from New York Agriculture in the classroom. I think they're fabulous and fantastic. Um, what I wanted to really talk about is, you know, deforestate, deforestation and where the lumber and the processing. And I love to hear that he had mentioned about that he uses every scrap piece and, and so forth, because I run an environmental club that starts in the middle school, but actually these students do a lot at the high school level. So because high school students um, needed that background foundation and some um, excitement to want to join, um, that's my job. And so um, we are doing a lot with lumber within our um, own area in the sense that the students were, are going to go out on field trips and to talk about, you know, even the pencil. That's why I asked you about the pencils because um, we find them all over the floor and they might chew up three or four a day. But really, where are we um, in the in the realm of things with trees? You know, is there a better way? Is everything being used from a tree that's being cut down? When is that? And so I was really specifically answering, wanting to ask questions or hear about information that I can bring back to them in our next meeting and talk to them about what I learned here today. Awesome. Now, Susan, did you get a chance? 
Oh, good. Oh, well, I'm so excited to hear all of that. But did you get to watch our last virtual field trip with in the forest with the forester? No, I did not. Oh, we'll make sure to include that in the follow up in case you all missed it. But I think your students would be really interested in that. That was a student virtual field trip. And um, later today, we'll get a chance to meet the forester. Uh, oh. And yeah, we're going to talk with the owner of the company and um, a forester um, who's been with the company a long time. So they'll be able to talk about all of those pieces about forest ecology, um, about their process and how they take care of that land. But I think that you'll really enjoy the virtual field trip also. I have a very quick question, please. And the reason yeah. I can sign up for it is I teach fifth, or excuse me, the students in the club are fifth, sixth, and seventh. So our times are all different throughout the day. That particular um, virtual field trip you just mentioned, is that something that is um, accessible to me if you were to send me a copy of that? Yeah, yeah. We'll include it in the follow-up. It's on YouTube. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was just last week. <laughs> so yeah, it's very fresh. <laughs> so we'll definitely send that out. Um, now I see we have Holly with us. Holly can't hear, but I think she's reading along. Um, but Holly teaches in New Hampshire. Um, she's a former um, a former agriculture teacher here in New York. So hi, Holly. Um, and then Carly, do you want to say hello? Yeah, I'm in transit right now to get my daughter, so I'll be on it a little bit. But yeah, um, okay. uh, so I, I teach um, agriculture at Penny Ann. Um, I love doing uh, the Ag in the Classroom PDs. I've used a lot of the le lessons and like kind of lab activities that Jeremiah has shown. Um, so I was super excited. I just finished forestry, though, in my Enviro class. So this will be something on the docket for next year's class when I can look at things. But great PD that you guys put on. I, I appreciate all that you guys do. Awesome. Thank you, Carly. Um, and I think Sarah McArdle joined us. Sarah, you want to say hi? All right. Hi. <laughs> it's driving. So I just pulled over. Don't worry. Um, so I'm Sarah McArdle. I'm a third grade teacher in Burnox Westerlo, which is the rural part of Albany County. Um, I love Ag in the Classroom. I use a lot with my students. Um, we have an after school Ag Pals Club that is third through fifth grade, kind of like a, a starter club for our FFA program, kind of get them interested. And they use a lot of the Ag in the Classroom activities every month um, that I have provided through awesome grants and um, all this oppor uh, professional development opportunities that you guys have given. Um, so we do a lot of that. And uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, well, thanks for being with us, Sarah. Thanks for listening along. Sarah, again, another one of our superstar Ag in the Classroom teachers. So I love her. So thank you all so much for being here. So the next, the next thing that we'll do, we'll actually transition to um, doing one of the, you have two lessons and two kits that were provided in your toolkit today. And the first one that we're going to do is the source search. Now, I really love this uh, lesson because it's just great to uh, set some context for your students. Um, so we're gonna have, we're just gonna move through a few pieces of this lesson that I think are important. So in the chat box, I have sent a Jamboard. So go ahead and click on that Jamboard. Um, when you get on that Jamboard, you have two questions to ask. So go ahead and um, grab a sticky note and on your sticky note, tell me what you ate today. And then go ahead and move to slide two up at the top um, and talk about some day-to-day -day items that you use today. I know Susan, she's gonna put down pencils, but I want you all just to take a moment. What, what have you eaten today? Give me that on one sticky note and then make a list of some of the day-to-day -day items that you, um, you've used. Katie, I think mine is view only, so I can't. Oh, geez, I'm so sorry. I always, this always happens with um, with Google things. All right, we are gonna make you all editors. Okay, I'm gonna copy it, done just in case you need to re try to refresh that or use that link I just shared, you should be able to type now. Yeah, it's working. Good. Google does me dirty sometimes, so I'm sorry about that.
Okay. Now he added a few of mine. On both slides. Oh, everyone is uh, all right. Oh, I'm seeing lots of coffee on here. <laughs> oh, somebody had an enchilada. I'm pretty jealous. All right, very good. Make sure you go to slide two also. Tell us about your day-to-day -day items. All right, so we, we're starting to see on both of these slides, as you're starting to reflect and think about your day, there are hundreds of items that we interact with from um, the plates or trays that we use for the meals um, that, we, that we had to getting in our car and driving to our workplace. Um, we are interacting with hundreds of items throughout the day without even thinking about it. Um, and so we really want to start thinking about what are the source of some of these items. Uh, and this uh, is an activity where you are going to have a chance to um, do a little quiz or do a little brain bender. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to move, show you my screen. And you have a job. I'm going to get my screen shared right here. And you have a job. And your job is to put into the chat box. So have your chat box fingers ready. I'm gonna make sure I can see your chat. All right, I can see everything here. Um, you're gonna have a job, you need to decide. I'm gonna show you a bunch of different items Now, as quick as possible. I want you to put in the chat box um, what you think the source of these items are. There's lots of different items, you'll have lots of chances. So, um, I'm going to show you the, the options here. So we have a camera. What is the original source of the camera? And get your fast fingers ready. Um, so what are, the, what are the options? Store, farm, factory, or natural resource? What is the original source of that camera? All right, good guesses. I'm going to move to the next one. We're going to move pretty quick. And that's a natural resource. Hmm, interesting. All right, so what's the original source of a hamburger? Again, oh, sorry, I, I cheated on that one for you. Yep, the original source of a hamburger, that comes from a farm out of your four different choices. What's the original source of cat food? Again, store, farm, factory, and natural resources. Hmm, natural resources and farm. All right, let's see. That's a farm product. Hmm, what's the original source of toilet paper? Store, farm, factory, natural resources. Answer is farm. Hmm. Original source of cookies. All right, farm, French fries. Farm, you bet. Fleece, original source of fleece. If you had a fleece vest or fleece jacket. Hmm, oh, hoo -hoo. There is uh, uh, one different answer. Let's see, natural resources. So that is a, think about it, that is a plastic product. 
poly, uh, made from polys. It's not made, uh, it's not fleece that we wear in our vests is not necessarily made from a, um, from a sheep. What's the original source of this blender? What are we going with? Store, farm, factory, natural resources. All right. You bet, you bet, natural resources. What is the original source of cheese? Yeah, you bet, farm. Fruit. Good job. Vegetable juice. Yeah, farm. About salt. Mm, good thinking, good thinking. Natural resources, the mind product. Cheerios. Yeah, farm. If you're out in the Buffalo area, you can, the whole city smells like Cheerios, right? <laughs> All right, uh, original source of a hot dog. A farm. Eggs. Yeah. What about this watch? Farm, factory, store, natural resources. Yeah. Natural resources. Water. You bet. All right, well, and we're gonna pause right there because you get the gist of, of this activity. Um, at the beginning, I did see a couple of responses where we um, talked about, um, we talked about you know some uh, uh maybe you thought originally that that camera came from a store but when we think about the original sources of these items um yeah it's one of two categories uh it's either going to be coming from our natural resource it's being mined um or coming from something that's naturally occurring or it's going to be coming from a farm and now i think the inter interesting interaction is that um a farm uses a lot of those natural resources to produce those farm-based items. So as we're looking at relationships of things one another to one another, um, it's all really well connected. And uh, so in this, in the lesson, you actually have four different, um, you probably saw four different baskets and those are labeled are four different categories we were talking about. And then your students have to work to categorize all of these 36 different items um and and so for them they are really going to they might originally think that their their iphone or their ipad comes from a factory or comes from a store but then you can really start taking those pieces apart and something like a vehicle is super interesting because not only do you have the the steel um the glass that you know, originally comes from sand that you can talk about and explore all the plastic pieces but in vehicles, we also have rubber tires. We know rubber comes from cotton. We have leather seats and leather steering wheels. That comes from a farm. So some of our products are both farm and um, farm and natural resource occurring. So it really is a great way to begin to stretch and, and bend those brains. Um, so, you know, it, the way you can set up with your students, there's already um, created and available um, cahoots and, and quizzes that you can share with your students to move through these activities or use the great hands-on resources um, that you were provided. Um, and then they can do relay race types game games. Um, they can do really quick um, sorting games. So it makes it a pretty fun experience for them. Um, so we're excited to give you that um, source search activity. Um, and we really think it's a way as we talk about the timber industry, natural resources, um, renewable resources and non-renewables um, to help frame the conversation about how the um, timber industry is part of a food and agriculture and fiber systems in our state. All right, so 
before we move on, we're going to have your chance to um, meet with Jeremiah and get to know him and also meet some of our friends at Gutchess. Um, I want to share with you just a few tools and resources. That lesson that you just received is on our national curriculum matrix. So if you're on our website, you're going to scroll down here and you're going to be able to do searching. You can search any word that you want. And uh, I'm just going to pop in the word dairy. So this is a keyword search um, tool. It's over 500 of the best lessons from across the country, all in one place for you. Um, the beauty about this national curriculum matrix, our searchable lesson database, is that every single lesson has been vetted by a team of agricultural literacy specialists. Um, every single lesson uh, is aligned to curriculum standards, and we're increasingly, you know, making those alignments to next gen and, and doing some uh, alterations to make sure they fit to next gen. Um, so every single lesson looks exactly the same. Uh, you'll see uh, all the materials that you need. If there are, uh, if, there, if there's a PowerPoint included with a lesson you're interested in, um, if there's a worksheet, it's all included for you under essential files. Uh, vocabulary is included. And the best part is remember, we usually work with teachers who maybe don't have a uh, ag background or non-certified to teach agriculture. There's all this great background information for you. Um, so then of course, just as teachers, we know there's an interest approach. We have all of our procedures for each activity laid out and every single lesson has hands-on learning components. So that's kind of the beauty of working with agriculture. Agriculture is innately hands-on. So we wanna make sure your students have those hands-on learning opportunities also. Uh, down here, these suggested companion resources. I said there were 500 lessons. Uh, we also have about 800 companion resources. These might be a standalone activity. It might be a multimedia resource. It might be a book connection. Um, and with every lesson you're looking at, I call this like the Amazon piece where it's like, oh, you like this? You might also like this. Um, so, for example, I might click on um, this Chuck's Ice Cream Wish. Oh, here's a great book that I may want to pair with that lesson. Every companion resources, then on the other hand, says, okay, here's some lessons you might like on this topic. So, it's really helping to think uh, with you. And then you also have an advanced search up here so you can pare down what you're looking for um, to get pretty specific. So the matrix is here, it's free, it's open source for you to use. Um, it's one of, our, one of our gems of what we get to do. Now, what's happening in Ag in the Classroom right now? Uh, we just wanna share some things that you might wanna be aware of. Number one, if you like these um, professional development experiences, we would love for you to come to our National Agriculture in the Classroom Conference. We are hosting that conference for the first time ever in New York State. It's going to be in Saratoga Springs from June 28th to, through July 1st. We are going to be launching uh, scholarships for you to attend that conference. Uh, the conference is unique because the first day you're there, you get put on buses and you get to actually go to farms and you get to talk with farmers and you get to look at uh, food processing and fiber processing across the state. So that's a pretty exciting piece of that conference. Then you get Awesome PD with um, over 650 others from across the country. Uh, we just selected our workshops the other day and um, we're really excited that there'll be some great New York uh, presenters who will be part of that experience, uh, along with people from across the country who are experts in this field and use food and ag in their classrooms every single day. You should also know that we have uh, currently registration is open for our maple contest. Each year we do a maple syrup contest where you get to make maple syrup with your students. Um, we have an elementary, middle, and high school division, and really this is just about you making syrup with your kids. Uh, if you are one of the first 50 teachers to sign up, you uh, will get a kit to help you make maple syrup in your classroom. Um, you'll get sat bags, holders, a tapping bit. Um, you'll get spouts. You'll get a hydrometer uh, and even a, a test cup to test your syrup. And you send those samples into us and your classroom. Classroom can win some prizes. 
we always try to think about how we can add art in agriculture. Uh, and we are going to have a photography contest included also. So if your students are taking photos, if you're taking photos, you can submit those photos to win an additional $50. And they'll be part of a, an exhibit at a View Arts in Old Porch. Um, so your students will get to go see their work hanging in a gallery, which is very neat. With that, um, I'll we, say, Katie, my kids absolutely love the maple stuff, and they were so excited last year that we got second. So, like, we just do a small amount, guys. You really don't need a whole lot, um, and the kids absolutely love it. And that hydrometer lesson um, is uh, awesome too. I love. It. Uh, thanks, Carly. Yeah, so we we pair, uh, you know, and share a lot of great lessons that are already existing. And the one Carly's talking about, you actually make your own hydrometer so the students understand how that works. The cool part about making syrup with your students is they get really invested in it. They um, really get excited. They grasp vocabulary super quickly because they're learning while they're doing. Um, and so that's really the crux of what we do. So there, we have a lot of other tools and resources. Those are the high, that's the highlight reel for the moment. Um, I'm going to check in with Jeremiah. Jeremiah, are you there? I am here, Katie. It's nice uh, to be in this warm uh, conference room. So, <laughs> Jeremiah has been outside all day, um, but at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremiah to introduce our guest. And I know I have a great question from Sue that we'll definitely get to, um, but we're excited for this next discussion. So thank you all so much for being with us. So good evening. It's, it's great to see you all here with us. Um, I am the man behind the camera. So I, I was with you for the last uh, 50 minutes or so and with many of your classes all day long. Um, and we're always excited to spend our time with educators. Um, I was my uh, educator myself, elementary educator before I joined New York Agriculture in the classroom. For many of those who don't know me, I was a fifth grade teacher, third grade teacher. Um, really love education, and we were able to teach um, through the lens of agriculture, and I know many of y'all are doing such a great job um, doing that in your classrooms, and we're glad that many of y'all have joined us to learn how to do that if you haven't really um, jumped on this pedagogy, but as part of our training, one of the things that we love to do is talk to the professionals in the field. Um, we think this is a great opportunity for you as educators to uh, speak with these professionals that have done it all their life um, and, and really, you know, ask those real questions of the different concepts that we're teaching. So, of course, we're within the temper industry. Um, so I would like to uh, introduce Mr. John Mueller, who is the Gutchess Forrester, um, and Mr. Matt Gutchess, who is the president of Gutchess Lumber. Um, and we're going to ask them some questions, but as we um, are talking with these, these two gentlemen this evening, um, feel free to put those questions that you might have in chat or, uh, you know, raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, we want you to ask any questions that you have that have to do with the timber industry, any maybe things that you have learned or heard about. Um, if you think there's some misconceptions out there, we, we definitely welcome that. So I will let them start um, by um, first letting Mr. Gutches uh, share his history with the company um, and who he is and what he does. Okay, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Matt Gutches, um, uh, fifth generation uh, Gutches in the um, uh, Gut Gutches Lumber Company. Um, we, uh, we we were we started in 1904. Uh, the uh, that's that's the first year that we have a you know record of the company. We have a photograph, uh, some horses bringing bring some logs and you know over to a to a small mill. Uh, it was run by my uh, great great grandfather uh, George Gutchess. Um, that we may have existed before 1904, but we don't have any records, so we tend to call consider that our our founding date. Um, the company the company was um, was was located here in uh, Cortland County, Central New York. Um, you know, in, in the 1950s, we settled on uh, current current location right here uh, as, as our as our central location. And um, you know, my my grandfather was was getting into the business at, at that time. Um, his his major innovation was to develop uh, drying uh, wood drying technology. And you know, pre previous to 
to that, um, you know, furniture manufacturers in, in the U.S. primarily, you know, North Carolina was a big, uh, big area for, for, for furniture manufacturing, but they all dried their own lumber. Um, so my, my grandfather thought, well, if he could figure out how to dry it himself, he wouldn't just be, you know, kind of dealing with, with North Carolina, he'd be able to send, send lumber all over, all over the world. Um, so, so he, uh, over the course of a long career, he uh, built uh, 20, 29 dry kilns here in, in our Cortland plant. He also uh, built, a, built a drying plant in, um, in Western Pennsylvania, uh, near, near Pittsburgh, um, another 25 kilns there. So he was a real innovator, and the business grew, you know, rapidly throughout throughout his career, uh, particularly in the '80s and '90s. Uh, international demand for for U.S. hardwoods uh, was, grew by leaps and bounds through through, through those periods. Um, so so um, you know, it, it's been an exciting you know growth trajectory that we've had. You know, really. Uh, again, again, since the 80s, we've gone from, from this one site here in Cortland to uh, seven sites today. Uh, some we, we built from the ground up, others, others we acquired, um, you know, sawmills, dry, dry lumber plants, uh, wood yards, uh, pallet, uh, pallet manufacturing. Uh, you know, I, I began in the business uh, full full time, right right at the the downturn there uh, back in 08, 09, the great great recession. Uh, it was finally business was finally hard enough that, that I thought I would get involved in it and uh, came in and you know it was pretty pretty rough going for for a year or two with uh, just 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 the economy being being so poor. But uh, since since then we've. We, you know, we've done well, and and uh, we, you know, we've built a built a very strong strong team here uh, in this company. Um, you know, some of the things I enjoy about about my work here, um, you know, one is the, you know the the obvious challenge. Um, you know, there's a lot of competition, a lot of a lot of a uh, lot of issues in in the, in the industry, but I I really get excited about two you know you know two two things I I, I think that we bring. You know, Gutcha Slumber brings our, our whole industry brings to, to our region. Uh, one is an economic benefit. Um, you know, the, um, I think we all know that, that the U.S. Uh, you know we import you know tremendous amounts of goods, so we're sent, we're sending you know money out to other other countries. Um, you know, China, a lot, number of other places, and and uh, bringing products back. We do the opposite. Um, we're, we're actually taking money from, from, from these other parts of the world, bringing them back and, and we're putting it back into our communities. You know, we're, we're putting it into paychecks for our employees. We're putting it into payments for, for timber and logs, our, our regional, uh, regional farmers, you know, all across New York state. Um, we're, we're, we're using these, you know, foreign dollars uh, to, to promote our own communities uh, across, across New York and, and, and Pennsylvania. Um, so we're, so we're sort of a counterweight to, to a lot of the, you know, the trend for, for large trade deficits and, and so forth. And I, I, I enjoy that. And I enjoy um, being able to develop, you know, the, these renewable products that we have. Uh, it's not like, you know, you're taking advantage of a resource that you can't replace. You can replace it. You, you can send it, send it overseas and, and, and bring, you know, hard currency back <laughs> for, for the benefit of our, our local economy. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I get excited about is uh, the environmental benefit that, that's, that, that we, are, we are providing. I uh, mentioned um, sustainability, but, but you know these trees when when they're cared for properly when these woodlots are, are cared for properly and John John is you know an expert in, in this area but um, you know we we can you know a managed forest is able to regenerate itself much more rapidly than an aged forest in which you know the canopy is closed the sun you know sunlight doesn't reach the ground new trees new trees can grow, but, but, but it's a much, much slower process. Whereas we're able to open up that tree stand, allow the sunlight to hit the forest floor, promote rapid growth of, of new trees. And what, you know, what does that rapid growth do? Uh, it, it pulls carbon out of the air and it pulls it out of the air much more rapidly than, than a mature standing forest can do. So we're, we're encouraging that 
through removal of, of the, you know, the, the overstory trees. But then it's even better than that because we're, you know, instead of that wood just, just decaying in, in the forest and the carbon going back into the atmosphere, we're putting it into furniture, into flooring, into stair treads, um, cabinets, all kinds of finished products, which, you know, the, the, they stay around for a long time. Um, you know, maybe you're on, maybe you only use you know, cabinets for 25, 50 years, and then they're replaced by something else. Well, that cabinet doesn't just get thrown away. It's usually put in a landfill and, and, and buried. And, you know, you've sequestered carbon, um, you know, indefinitely in, in, in many cases. So it, it's this powerful engine of carbon sequestration and new, new growth of, of new trees that we're really able to accomplish. Um, so it, it's it's a it's a really a great story with an economic and an environmental component to it, uh, which which I find fabulous. I, I I'd be hard pressed to go and, and find you know another another line of, of work or business that 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 could accomplish all this. So that's uh, that's kind of my introduction. Um, so John, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, a little bit about your history. Um, and I, I think uh, Matt definitely covered some uh, very important topics that, that are um, taught throughout our school with that carbon sequestration. Um, and we're talking about climate change constantly. So can you just introduce yourself um, and, and just what you do as a forester and kind of elaborate a little more on some of these concepts? Thank you, Jeremiah. Yes, <clears throat> so uh, I'm a forester for Gotcha Slumber. Uh, I was hired by... Uh, Matt's grandfather uh, to come here in 1988 to uh, manage company timberlands, which we own about uh, 30,000 acres of forest land here in New York State and Pennsylvania, and also to purchase timber from private landowners. I have a degree, of, uh, an associate degree in forest technology from Morrisville, uh, SUNY Morrisville, and then later I went on and got a Bachelor of Science at uh, SUNY ESF at Syracuse. I worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service, for a couple of years in the state of Idaho. And so I bring a little bit of experience of the Western, managing Western forests. So my, my, I come from a farming background just south of Syracuse. And I, I enjoy being in the forest. I like to see a forest. They're, 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 they're a wonderful, wonderful place uh, as a forester. I am also a member of the Society of American Foresters and I'm a certified forester under their uh, certified forester program. So not only, so to be a forester, it's just like, I think in some ways like a teacher. It's an art and it's a science to manage a forest. And it's important, and I think it's important. There's two things I think about forests is they're, they're dynamic and they're renewable. And what I mean by dynamic is they're ever changing. Sometimes we think a forest is that's it. That's the state they're always in. But that's not the case. Mother Nature has other ideas for it. We see forest fires out west. We see some here locally. We see ice storms. We see big blowdowns, forests blow down because of wind. And uh, those are kind of the fun things about forestry is it's changing. And uh, and you get to see a different forest almost every day. And uh, that's, that's what I enjoy about our, our forest here. So um, before we get a little more into the conversation, uh, I wanna open it up to any teachers. Um, you know, we, we've heard a little bit about uh, sequestration and dynamic forest. Are there any questions that you might have um, from Matt or John? Well, Susan had a great question earlier, so I'm going, I did told her I didn't want to lose her question. Um, so I'm going to ask what she wrote, but then Susan, feel free to jump in for any um, other thoughts you might have. So she said, you mentioned that 800 to 1,000 logs um, were coming into your facility um, per day or per week. I'm just wondering um, the amount of time these logs were growing before your company decides that they should be cut down therefore trying not to have deforestation happening so quickly. Is your company responsible for planting the new trees for the next, next time uh, you want to harvest them? Great, great question. So for a mature tree, it takes between 
from a seedling all the way to it's ready to be harvested. It's a, between 80 to 120 years for that tree to be, uh, I'm gonna say uh, economically uh, valuable. Now, biologically, that tree could, of course, grow a little bit longer, but for the tree and the tree growth, that tree reaches its maximum economic viability between uh, 80 to 120 years old. Depending on how you structure your, your harvest, how you, the landowner wants to manage that forest, will determine how that forest regenerates. And there are certain patterns, harvesting patterns that we use to get certain trees to regenerate. If we wanted to grow black cherry, for instance, in central New York, for us to get black cherry to grow, we need to open the stand up and get sunlight to hit the floor the forest floor, because just like the cherries that you buy uh, at a grocery store, that pit, that cherry pit falls to the ground for black cherry and it can sit there. And some, and they have some research, it can sit there for 50 years as a seed viable until it has the right conditions around it for it to germinate and start to grow. So if an individual wants to grow black cherry on their fire forest, then we need to open a stand up, let the sunlight hit the forest floor that rises the soil temperatures and makes a microclimate for that seedling to start growing. If we wanted to grow maple, we don't have to open the stand up very much. We can leave it closed because it's what they call a shade tolerant species. It can grow and have kind of a shaded area and that needs for that for that uh, seedling to grow. I got to give you one, one quick story. <laughs> When I first came in 88, there was a forester here by the name of Maynard Spencer. He was here since the early 50s. And I go to Maynard, I said, Maynard, uh, you know, it seems like this company uses a lot of logs and, and we think we deplete the resource. And he said, John, that's a good that's a, a question. But he said, when I came here in the late 40s, early 50s, I asked the forester before me, and I, and he told me that, uh, you know, the trees grow and here Maynard had his whole career from the fifties all the way until 1990, when I came 1988, his whole career buying timber, managing timber. And here I am in my career and I've got another, I've gone 33 years and I constantly find timber. So that dynamic of force, that's because it grows, it grows maybe 2%, 4% a year. And not all the forest is, is, is cut down at one time. And then what's interesting about New York State is in about 1880, 1890, 75% of New York State was already cleared. Just after the Civil War, 1890, 75% uh, of New York State was all cleared. There wasn't any forest. And now here we are, uh, 65 to 70 percent of New York State has forest cover. And so the forest can come back and it's dynamic and it's changing. And there it took some people with some foresight in 1900, 1910, when the conservation movement started, where we needed to put away the Adirondack Park in different areas on our state forests. So well, the other factor there, you know, I think a lot of people think of forestry and they think of, you know, practices in the Amazon or, you know, other, other, other tropical areas where, um, you know, logging is done and trees are removed and then the land is converted to other uses, right? Um, but, but in the Eastern US, when, when, when we are logging and we're, we're removing trees, uh, we're, we're not changing the, the use of the land. That, that land is still forest. We're leaving, you know, many, many trees, we're leaving seed trees to do some of, some of what John just explained, how, you know, trying to regenerate cherry or, or, or hard maple. Uh, we're leaving seed trees, we're leaving other trees to protect the, the new trees, you know, from, from wind damage and so forth. So that, that land is still forest. Um, you know, even, even after a relatively heavy, heavy logging. Um, so we're not actually converting forest into non-forest. And in fact, we'd, 
we'd be happy to see the opposite. We'd be happy to have even even more than you know than, than 65, 70 percent of the state uh, forested. We harvest timber all over the state. Some of the places, I know we have a teacher from New York City or down that way, we harvest timber around the reservoirs that supply water to New York City. The uh, reservoirs are up in the Catskill region of New York. We harvest timber around those reservoirs in a sustainable way. And they find out the water quality can be better if the forest is managed than if it was just left uh, to let nature do what it has. So we harvest timber around uh, Gloverville, uh, Gloversville watershed, Herkimer watershed, Utica watershed. We've harvested timber on all those watersheds that supply water to the, all those towns and cities. So it's, it's beneficial for it. And as Matt mentioned, a lot of people say, well, deforest, deforestation down in South America is like it here. It's not because really, the soil types, the soils in the, in the temperate United States, the nutrients are locked up in the soil. And there is some in the, car the carbon stored in the, the organic matter, but in, but in South America, the soils are different. There is no nutrients in the soil. Most of the soil is locked up in the biomass. So when you remove the biomass, you remove all the nutrients. We're here in the temperate forest, once you remove some of the trees, you're not removing uh, the, the nutrients out of, out, of the, out of the soil. Two totally different soil types uh, and they react differently. And I know that's definitely a concept that many of us teachers address in our classrooms and in our uh, next generation science standards is soils and soil health. Um, and, and that's definitely something that is uh, very important to foresters. So um, I think we have another question from a teacher. Go ahead. Oh. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so when you um, harvest the timber or the trees, you don't like, okay, this acreage, we're gonna cut all these trees down and then replant them at the same time. It's more um, not just um, whole cutting it down all in one area and then replanting. So, so there's a, by the way, I have a, I had a person that I went to school with at ESF, graduated as a forester, and he's a forester in Central Park right now. So <laughs> there, there's jobs out there for foresters all over the United States. It's, it's uh, so he's a, he's a forester in Central Park. He manages those elm trees down there, and that's kind of interesting. But to get back to your point, get back to your point. So there's two systems that are used to manage our hardwood forest. Those are the trees that we use. The softwoods management is a little different. Uh, hardwood forests, we manage them two ways. We can manage them what they call even age, and then there's another system called uneven age. Even age force, if managed, it's even age is like a crop of corn growing up all at one time. All the trees are the same age, same age. There's very few uh, other size trees or other age classes of trees. And when, we, when you harvest trees like that, that what you call, when they clear all the trees, they may clear all the big trees, but they don't clear and they manage for all the small trees that are coming up. So even though you look at the forest and say, well, I don't see any big trees because they caught all the big trees up down, there's still a high number of stems per acre of small trees that in 80 to 120 years are gonna be a big tree. That's even age forest. Uneven age forest is when you go in and you maybe select only 10, 10 trees or 15 trees out of, on an acre of land, out of a possibility of 200 trees per acre. So there may be 200 trees per acre, you're only gonna remove a small portion of those. That's uneven age management. In New York state, the DEC has determined most of our forests are even age forests. So there's, there's two different ways of managing it. 
but there's always trying to put trees on the acre of land. Sometimes they're a little small, and sometimes they're they're huge. They're you know you can't get your arms around. Because I, I was wondering, like with the Christmas tree industry, you know they tend to like you know a whole field would be one mm -hmm. acre and they harvest them. So I was just wondering with that kind of constant harvesting. Not, I mean, it may take 15 years before they harvest. Yes. Um, does that deplete the soil? Um, you know, that's a great question too. So that, with the Christmas trees, they remove, they, they sometimes put fertilizer on a Christmas tree uh, farm, mm -hmm. but them removing that tree, that's really not removing a lot of nutrients. It's removing carbon. Right. The carbon is, of course, taking CO2, combining with water with a little bit of nutrients and, and producing a cellulose. And so when you see that big tree go and that the size of those trees, you say, wow, that's a lot of nutrients leaving a site. It really isn't. And, it, and it also a lot of nutrients are in the leaves and the twigs and those are left in the woods for them to rot down and produce uh, nutrients for the, the future the future for us. Um, one more question about like disease or pest or invasive species. Do you find that's any issue with the climate change? Uh, I, I didn't quite. Is that an issue with climate change? Um, climate change. Disease or pest or invasive species in the forest? So, yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I guess I, I think that there probably are connections. You know, there, there are invasives which have, have come in to, to the country. And, and as the climate changes, that does impact the way different different insects are, you know, can, can spread. Um, but, but really, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're two simultaneous processes going on at, at the same time. We, we have battled in New York, of course, you know, different invasive insects, one, one being the emerald ash borer, which, um, which attacks, you know, att attacks our, our ash trees and, and, it, and it kills them uh, quite, quite rapidly. This, this insect came, came from, from Asia back in the, the late 90s, kind of, kind of spread, for, um, you know, attacked in the, the upper Midwest, Kind of spread into western New York, uh, uh, central New, you know, pretty pretty well most most through New York State, um, and it's un it's unfortunate because this is such a such a beautiful species of of, of tree, but it, it's uh, it's caused a lot of damage, and I know that there there are efforts ongoing to to crossbreed different different types of ash, hope of coming up with something that can re can resist. Um, but but it's it's been it's been a it's been a real challenge really um, you know for for the whole the whole region um, it and, and John can speak to this better better than I can but but that 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 insect is, is tolerant of a wide range of of, of, of climate I, I think extreme colds you know mm -hmm. when it's you know like thirty below or mm -hmm. or more can can wipe it out but we don't really get you know that in, in New York, and of course it's less extremely cold all the time. So um, that's the major um, invasive uh, insects that that we've dealt with. There there are other invasive plants which which affect our our forests. You know can compete with the natives. You know trying trying to grow back up. Uh, some sometimes the deer, but deer are very prevalent across our state, and the, they will chew up. You know the the maple seedlings that we're we're trying to regenerate, but they'll leave the invasives, which they have no taste for. They'll leave those on, right there on the ground. So you wind up with a whole ground of, of invasives. Um, the, serious challenges for for us. Um, and, you know we 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 look at different 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 possible solutions. Um, you know keeping the deer out out of out of woodlots it's, it's been shown to really really help with the regeneration it's just just coming up with practical ways to do that you know in, in a on a large scale uh, but some, something we're, we're working on so i know we're running short on time um, we do have another lesson that i will quickly talk about i want to give you matt just one chance uh, or just a quick opportunity um, we did have a question if you could quickly respond 
Um, if teachers want to come and, and take a tour with their students um, or tour with John, would that be something that Gutches would be open to doing? We'd not only be open, we would, we would welcome the opportunity. We'd love, love to show what, what, what we do here and explain, explain the process from, from beginning to end. So that would be, that'd be fantastic. And now for young people who want to get into the industry, who might want to be a forester, um, might want to learn how to log, go to ESF or Paul Smith. Is there anything that Gutches does for those students? We do have a we do um, have a scholarship at, at, at SUNY ESF up in Portland that we've maintained for for years, um, and we 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 are always looking, um, you know, to, to recruit out of, out of forestry schools. We've recruited many you know many many people in, in the company, not not just foresters, um, but that, that is a great great opportunity to to come. To work for a company like ours with with some some knowledge already and get you know get a jump start on on a, on a career. Well, awesome! I want to thank you both. Um, I think that was very insightful. A great opportunity for us educators um, to just dip into the world of timber. Um, I want to quickly uh, flip the camera. Finally, get to meet me. Hi, nice to see you. Um, we did send a couple lessons and and. Our professional development kit that we sent this um, this time around, we did include many of the uh, items that we placed in um, our virtual field trip inquiry boxes. So if you haven't done our virtual field trips, um, we usually try to send an inquiry box so that your students can get a, sen a sensory feel for the different places that we're engaging and heighten their um, senses. So one of the things I wanted to point at is uh, Mr. Gutch has uh, showed you this slab, and this is the first cut um, of the uh, lumber that comes in. And it's a great chance to do a sequencing lesson, especially with ELA. Um, we did include a hardwood. This would be the second cut. Um, and this is would be the finished lumber. Uh, so it's a great ELA um, activity with your students to write those sequencing paragraphs. Um, and then you also have a compare and contrast with walnut and maple, uh, really to look at those species. Um, we did send you a lesson um, in your kit. Um, if, how many people, if I could see a show of hands, um, got a chance to open their kit and got to dig in? I just got it today. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think we definitely loaded you up um, at this PD and we usually, so we, we really look forward um, we really look forward to seeing you all at additional PDs. So this kit, the Planet Zorcon kit, um, if you want to reorder the kit, comes from our Ag in the Classroom store, which you can find online. But it's focused on management. And I think both of our guests or our hosts today would uh, really identify that we have a lot of concerns globally uh, about where our plan is going and, and where things are going. Um, and a lot of these outcomes that we are facing um, have to do with the way we have managed our resources. Um, and this kit really helps your students um, really identify how we can start managing resources. Um, it focuses on uh, having to go to another planet because we have overused or mismanaged our resources um, here on earth and how do they harvest those. Um, so it's an amazing kit. Um, Hopefully you'll have a chance to dig in. Um, does anybody have any questions who have maybe had an opportunity to look into it? No. Um, so we have, um, as, as uh, both gentlemen will probably um, definitely uh, identify, it's really the focus. And I, I think they both hit on the fact that it's about management um, and something that uh, spending time with um, gutches and with their employees um, being in the forest with some of the foresters uh, there there's really a focus on how we can serve our environment um, I think in, in many of your classrooms you're really doing a great job in, in having your students really kind of capture that concept um, so before we let y'all go um, I know Katie is probably going to want to um, share a few last steps um, in, in getting that those CTLA credits um, 
and then discussing a few other things um, from at New York Ag in the Classroom. Thanks, Jeremiah. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to both Matt and John. Um, I will say they are one of the most, I work with a lot of groups in agriculture, um, but they are one of the most open and welcoming companies that I get the pleasure to work with. We've been working for a long time to try to get um, these experiences set up and now um, having our team expand, adding Jeremiah to it, um, and then being able to just um, with a pandemic um, in the state that it is in this place, um, to be able to bring teachers and students to experience both the forest and um, what happens at the mill. Um, we're just so grateful to them um, to build those ag literacy connections with the, the pieces that they interact with every single day. So thank you both so, so much. Bottom of my heart, it's a always a pleasure to work with you. <laughs> we also just want to talk about what are the next steps here? Um, so you are going to receive an email uh, in the next day or so um, with follow up from this uh, from this day. You are going to have uh, links to all of our virtual uh, P, uh, virtual field trips that we offered the last week in this week. You're going to get a link to today's PD if you missed anything or wanted to revisit something. Uh, and then you're going to receive links to the two lessons, both source search and Planet Zorcon that Jeremiah was talking about with all the instructions on how to facilitate those experiences in your classroom. The other thing that you're going to receive is uh, you're going to receive a, an evaluation. The last page of that evaluation, it's a short evaluation, so um, don't, don't be too scared of it. Um, the last page is going to be the information we need to process your CTLE. So that's going to be the most important link in your follow-up. Fill that out um, and we will process your CTLE um, and, and send that out to you. It's going to come from our um, program assistant, Sarah Hale. She'll send that directly to you. Uh, again, we uh, just are excited to see you integrate uh, our programs and tools and resources in your classroom. Uh, we are excited to see what you do next. And again, we'll also include um, John's outreach information. Um, he worked really great with outreach of, of anyone who wants to learn more about um, Gutchess and uh, forestry and what happens at the mill. So you'll be able to reach out directly if you wanted to schedule that tour. Uh, any final questions before we end today? Can I, can I ask a question, please? Yes, please. So I'm just trying to understand the biomass problem, the Amazon forest you mentioned, compared to our biomass. Is it because of the levels of the forest and it's, it's the canopy that is not giving enough sunlight to the roots of the trees? Because I, I, I know that it's we're losing a lot of that in the Amazon forest. And then you had said that you, your company um, does it differently. In, in the tree planting and so forth, and that we have better biomass. I was a little mis. mis okay, so mis yeah, I, I can I can maybe clarify that a little bit better. Is that the biomass can be in the ground? There's so there's nutrients and there's biomass. In our temperate forest, there's almost as much biomass in the ground as there is above the ground in the tree. So that that's that's generally what you find, and then you go down to the down into. Uh, South America and the tropical forest, a lot of their biomass is above the ground. I mean, they do have root systems, of course, but the nutrients, the nutrient cycling, there's very little nutrients in the soils in, I, I think they're called um, used to soils. And, uh, and there's very, that's the soil type. I, I think there's very little nutrients in the soil itself. And, uh, but, up here in the temperate forest, the nutrients are, are in our soils. So uh, when you remove you a so tree, much. yeah, if you remove a tree, and for us, we just remove the log, you think of that uh, a volume coming off. There's not a lot of nutrients removal on that. I know the College of Environmental, Environmental Science and Forestry have done studies about that nutrient removal, and it's, uh, it's not very much removal from a forest by just taking out the logs. And one other quick question, I was thinking that I had a tree cut down on our lawn because of um, a bug that had gotten into it. And for your cutting of the trees that we saw in the plant, 
And are you leaving the the root the roots, or are you cutting it and there's a stump left? I'm just curious how is how is that tree taken out of of the soil that you have yeah. that you're using? Yeah, so that's a good question. We we remove just the upper portion, so the root system and the stump are left about a foot and foot and a half above the ground. That is left in the soil. That's left on site. It's not removed, and it just stays there for it to rot and to de and to decay. Uh, and the tree itself then is brought brought out as a tree, cut up into logs, and brought to the mill. Thank which, you. Which helps to keep the soil so, intact, right? Yes. You, don't, you have much less risk of erosion that way when you're leaving those strong root systems in place. And I know from our Christmas tree virtual field trips, um, definitely go back and check those recordings out. Um, one of the reasons they leave those stumps is it also re returns nutrients. So they'll they'll plant right next to, um, like on a Christmas tree farm, they'll plant right next to a stump of a Christmas tree that they have harvested um, because that, that is going to give them a boost um, with returning some of that nutrients to the soil. Is it the same with hardwoods? There's nutrients that there is some, yeah. yeah. And for a hardwood regeneration, we don't plant hardwoods or very little for deciduous trees. That means for the trees that lose their, their, their leaves, the deciduous hardwood trees, the pattern that we use to harvest the trees propagates and regenerates. We want the genetics of the trees that are on the site to propagate the site for the future crops. And depending on how we set up the pattern of harvesting will determine what those, what those uh, genetics are gonna be and what trees are gonna be. So we, 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 we pay a lot of attention to how we set up the harvest and what trees we're trying to, to pr promote. Where the softwood trees that we see are uh, in, a lot of the softwood stands in New York State. We have some native, of course, spruce and white pine, but some of the uh, other plantations that are on state forest land, they've been planted. It's Norway spruce, red pine, scotch pine, uh, European larch. So a lot of the reforestation areas in New York State are planted by uh, and not naturally regenerated. Right, any other final questions? Well, again, thank you all so, so much. Thank you to our hosts. Thank you to our teachers. Thanks to Jeremiah for being out there in the cold today. Uh, we are excited to see what you do next. So thanks for being with us, everyone.